Welcome to this broadcast of God's Word. Today's message is titled Combat Equipment Part 4. This is about the soldier's footwear. The portion of scripture that is going to guide us is Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Lord guiding us, O oh Lord, and gathering us here that we may hear your word. We pray that you help us internalize your word, help us apply your word as we walk with you, that we be transformed by your word. Father, Lord, we thank you, we glorify, and we bless you. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and believe. Amen. So, the message today is about the footwear that we put on in order to win the battle against Satan and sin. So there is this gentleman called Shaquille O'Neal. He had a tiny problem with his foot. Such a small problem on such a big man wouldn't seem to matter. In 2002, the giant basketball star had just led the Los Angeles Lakers to a third straight championship and looking ahead to a new season. A fourth championship seemed almost certain, but the Lakers began the season as losers with Shaq on the sidelines. He had only one small problem, a bad toe. The toe had required surgery and Shaq sat out the first 12 games of new season. Shaq still stood over seven feet tall and weighed over 320 muscular pounds. But that didn't help as long as his toe needed to recover. No opposition player could stop Shaq, but the toe stopped him. The world champions sadly looked as bad as any team in the league. Playing without Shaq, they lost nine of their first 12 games. Even after he returned to the court, the Lakers lost 19 of their first 30 games. Eventually, the toe recovered, and Shaq O'Neal and the Lakers again became a force to reckon with. The difference between being champions and losers was one toe, something that you can look down to and think that it's a small thing, that it does not matter. That toe made Shaq not being able to perform at his best, and his team lost as a result. Small weakness can cause huge problems. That is true not just in professional basketball, but in spiritual warfare as well. Saturn is always looking for a weakness to exploit. He looks for ways to turn small sins into big problems that destroy people forever. Something starts as a small doctrinal error, and Satan finds a way to turn it into a huge heresy. Something starts as a careless choice, and Satan finds a way to make it a deadly addiction. Something starts as a little quarrel between husband and wife, and Satan turns it into a grudge and a divorce. Something starts as a minor disagreement between nations, and Saturn turns it into a war. Something starts as a little step away from God, and Saturn turns it into the highway to hell. Saturn is an expert in this. He looks you over, searching for a weak spot. It might seem small and unimportant, but Saturn can use it to bring you down. With an enemy like that, partial Protection isn't enough. You need total protection. When the Bible talks about spiritual warfare and the armor of God, it doesn't just say to put on a few parts of the armor to protect what you think is most important. It says to put on the full armor of God. It says to use every piece of equipment covering every parts of the body that might seem less important, such as the feet. 
Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 says to have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Proper footwear is key in winning battle even when the military are engaging the enemy. They must adorn themselves with the proper footwear. When the Bible talks about spiritual warfare against sin and Satan, it urges us to put on the full armor of God, including the right footwear. There may be areas of life that don't seem very important, but if we are careless in little things, Satan can use them to destroy us or make us ineffective in the service of Christ. To stay on your feet amid Satan's attack, to hold your ground against the devil, to march wherever Christ calls, and to triumph in the Lord, you need proper footwear. You need your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. A soldier needs proper footwear, not just for defense, but reasons, not only for defense reasons, but also to go on the offensive. The goal is warfare. The goal is that warfare is not just holding ground, but marching forward. Not just survival, but victory. Some of the great military campaigns of history depended on the ability of armies to move faster and further than their enemies thought possible. And the ability to march was helped by equipping soldiers with excellent footwear. Even today, we see the military is equipped with proper footwear in order to be able not only to stand their ground in war, but also to march forward and win territory. The armies of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar had brilliant leadership and excellent weapons. They also took good care of their feet. This enabled them to move swiftly and surely to outmaneuver opponents and to win amazing victories. Likewise, in spiritual warfare, the goal is not just survival, but victory. The aim is not just to avoid defeat, but to drive back the evil one and take territory away from him. To put it in another way, the aim is not just to resist Satan and avoid hell personally, but also to spread the message of eternal life to others, win them to faith in Jesus, and bring more parts of life under Jesus' life-giving rule. The readiness that comes from the gospel of peace is vital for defense and for offense. It enables you to stand firm and defend yourself when Satan attacks, and it enables you to go on the offensive and march forward to victory under Jesus' direction. When Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 says, to have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, what does it mean? For a soldier of Christ, readiness means that you are ready to stand firm and fight off Satan. It means you are ready to move into the enemy occupied territory, win victories for Jesus, and carry out the mission he gives you. Where does such readiness come from? The gospel of peace. The word gospel means good news or glad tidings. In Isaiah 52 verse 7, the Bible says in Isaiah 52 verse 7, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say your God reigns. The gospel is good news because it is the glad message of peace. The footwear is very important. And much as the footwear is important to a soldier, it is also important to a soldier of Christ in order for us to win spiritual war against sin and Satan. And this footwear entails, number one, peace with God, and number two, peace in your heart, and number three, peace spread to others. 
Let us look at peace with God. In spiritual warfare, a soldier of Christ must wear combat boots of peace. Isn't that a contradiction? How can war bring peace? How can the footwear of peace serve as combat boots? We sometimes, well, sometimes the best way to enjoy lasting peace is to first win a war that gets rid of a constant threat to peace. And sometimes the best way to win a war against a strong enemy is to make peace with a different enemy who is even stronger and who and who then becomes your ally in the war you need to win. Suppose you are weak, you are a weak nation, being attacked by a cruel, aggressive nation that won't leave its neighbors alone. The only way to have peace is war. The only hope of peace is to defeat that nation and be free from its aggression. But what if you are not strong enough to win this war? Well, suppose there is a third nation that is strongest of all. It's a good, peaceful, free nation, and it has the power to defend you and defeat your attacker. If that nation were your ally, you wouldn't win. You would win for sure if that nation was your ally. There is just one problem. You are not at peace with a good nation. That nation has never wronged you, but you still resent that nation. You have gone against its interest many times, and you have done various things to make yourself its enemy. This nation doesn't wish you ill. It isn't eager to destroy you, and it certainly isn't on the side of your evil enemy. But why shouldn't it why should it help you if you remain at odds with it? Why should it help you if you remain at odds with it? If it wanted to punish you, it wouldn't even need to attack you directly. It could simply leave you to the cruelty of your vicious enemy. To win a war against the nasty enemy, your only hope is to get on peaceful, friendly terms with your good enemy enemy. Peace with a good enemy is the key to winning the war with the evil enemy. The evil enemy here is the devil. And the good enemy, not that that nation is enemy to us or it has any grudge with us, but we have grudge against that strong, peaceful, free nation because we go against its, its interest. Every time you do something that is contrary to the word of God, you are acting contrary to the interest of the kingdom of God. And it's only God who has the power to overcome the devil. Remember, Satan is a spirit and we are in a lesser position than spirits. There is no way you can be able to fight Satan on your own. Because Satan is a spirit. And you cannot fight Satan with a physical weapon. You can only fight Satan with a spiritual weapon. And you can only get this spiritual weapon from God. Satan is an aggressive enemy. War against Satan is the only means to lasting peace. And making peace with God is the key to winning the war against Satan. Satan is stronger than we are, but God is stronger than Satan. The Lord will defeat Satan for us, but only if we are at peace with God. But how can you have a peace treaty with God if you are his enemy? People who sin and go against God's will, that is, all of us, are by nature God's enemies. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. Once we have made ourselves God's enemies, we are doomed unless God deals with our offenses, forgive our sins, and make us his friends again. This is exactly what God has done through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the price for our offenses, making peace through his blood, 
shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you, made you his friend by Christ's physical body through death. That's what the word of God tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. That we were once enemies with God in our minds. Why were we enemies? Because we are the descendants of Adam who sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. And therefore, that sin brought separation between us and God. And when we are separated from God, Satan then is available to deal with us. And he came to steal, to kill, and to destroy us. Jesus told us in John chapter 10, verse 10, that Satan came but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Therefore, when we are not at peace with God, through the blood of Jesus, the blood of atonement that pays for our sins and reconciles us back to God, then Satan will execute his mission upon us, which is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Therefore, we need to be at peace with God. Even after we have gone against God and done all sorts of damage, the Lord chooses to pay for the damage himself instead of requiring us to pay. He chooses to offer us peace treaty instead of whipping us out or letting Satan wipe us out. This peace treaty, this new covenant, is how we can stop being God's enemies and be his friends instead. In this friendship, this alliance, we no longer face Satan on our own. When we have peace with God, the Lord fights on our behalf. Peace with God is the key to winning the war against Satan. And once that war is won, we will have eternal peace and joy with no more grief or pain. Do you have peace with God? Have you accepted his peace treaty through faith in Jesus' blood? Peace with God and an alliance with him is entirely the work of Jesus. Accept his treaty by trusting Jesus. It is a horrible offense against the Lord to despise and reject his peace treaty after he has paid for it with his own blood. If you, reje you reject Jesus, you have no protection from Satan and no defense against God's anger. So trust God's treaty. Accept by faith what Jesus has done and God will be your ally and defender. Scripture says in Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have peace with God through our faith in Christ Jesus. God is no longer an enemy, but our best friend. The word of God tells us in Romans chapter 8 verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Even Satan himself can't stand against us if we are at peace with God. If God is for us, Satan cannot stand against us. The good news of peace with God equips our feet with readiness. This readiness is like wearing footwear with spikes. Dig in and stand firm against Satan. Don't slip and slide around. Be sure of the gospel. Don't change your mind. Keep believing in Jesus. Don't change your mood. Keep rejoicing in peace with God. The study footwear of readiness enables you to dig in your spikes and stand firm. This footwear also enables you to march against Satan in all types of territory. Go on, go on the attack against the evil one. Rescue others from his clutches. Enlist them in God's army. Scripture says, always, scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone 
who ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always being ready to witness for Christ. Always prepared, always ready. Have your feet fitted with readiness to share the gospel of peace with others. Tell how they can escape Satan's attacks and defeat him by accepting peace with God through faith in Jesus. That is the message of the gospel. Tell others what things Christ has done for you. Tell others that salvation is only found in Christ Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Salvation is found in no other, for there is no other name given under heavens upon which man must be saved but the name of Jesus. Tell others about this peace treaty with God so that they may enter that peace treaty, so that they be able not only to escape hell, but also to overcome sin and Satan. So let us now look at inner peace. Peace with God is an objective reality based on the work of Christ and the new covenant treaty established by God. This objective reality also produces the subjective experience of inner peace. When you know God is your friend, you have peace inside that is beyond anything words can explain. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7, The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The inner feeling of peace depends on the outer reality of peace with God. Some people try to make you feel better without actually making anything better. They like to say, peace, when there is no peace. Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 10. Nothing can really set your heart at peace except to know that you are right with God. Peace, devoid of God, is not peace. For peace with God is the real peace. Peace with God is the key to inner peace. If you are not right with God, if you are his enemy, you can't be truly calm. The Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing and despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread, both night and day, never sure of your life. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 65 to 66. God will do that in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we have peace with God by faith in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Have you believed and received Christ as the Lord of your life and personal Savior? Inner turmoil is often a symptom of being at odds with God. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Isaiah 48 verse 22. Peace with God is crucial to inner peace. If you are torn up inside by guilty feelings, God's pardon can bring peace. If you are full of anxiety and despair about the future, God's strength can give you peace. Lack of peace with God can sometimes move you to do things that are self-destructive or harmful to others. Something inside us tells us that if something is wrong, somebody's got to pay for it. So we either put ourselves through needless suffering or make other people suffer by being cruel to them. But if you know that Jesus has suffered for, for you and paid the price to give you peace with God, then you have inner peace. This inner peace replaces guilt with assurance, anger with compassion, fear with courage, despair with confidence. That is what peace with God does. The, it gives us inner peace. It replaces guilt. It gives us assurance. Anger is replaced with compassion. Fear is replaced with courage. And despair is replaced with confidence. That is what peace with God does to us. When God makes 
a peace treaty with you and you feel his peace in your heart, you become a fearless warrior for God. Satan loses his ability to intimidate you. Satan will attack your heart, but if your feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, your inner peace will stay strong. Thorns and sharp stakes and cruel snakes cannot pierce feet that are protected by peace. Jesus says in Luke chapter 19, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So that is what peace with God does to us. It gives us inner peace. And now let us look at spreading that peace. As we receive peace with God and experience inner peace, we must spread this peace to others. Wear those combat boots of peace. Stand strong against Satan. March forward against him and bring other people the good news of God's peace treaty. In spreading peace, begin at home. Make sure you are at peace with God and that your heart is ruled by peace, not by restlessness and combativeness. Make sure you are at peace with family members and fellow Christians. You can harm yourself and others if you go on the march in campaigns for various causes without the footwear of peace. You only the, your only result may be to upset others and to get upset yourself. When you are truly at peace, you might still upset people, but not as often and only for the right reason. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with all men. It is possible as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's what the word of God tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. In a war, it's especially important that you be at peace with others who are on your side. Fight the enemy. Don't fight each other. If members of a military unit are lobbing grenades at each other and shooting at their fellow troops, how can they ever defeat the enemy? They are defeating themselves. The Bible tells church people who bring lawsuits against each other that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, that the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already because you are supposed to have peace with God and you are supposed to have that inner peace and spread it to others. William Garner says that church people bickering with each other are like Navy shipmates arguing with each other while an enemy is drilling a hole in the bottom of their ship. Satan loves to stir up disputes among Christians. Arguments with fellow believers might not always seem so serious. And it begins with a little gossip here, a little grudge there, a little dispute over music now and then. But remember, Shaquille O'Neal told, a tiny foot problem can turn a champion athlete into a loser. A tiny lack of peace in the conscience, a tiny lack of peace with fellow Christians can make our feet vulnerable to injury and disable our effectiveness against Satan. God's people must, must be at peace with their own hearts and at peace with each other in order to stand up to Satan's attack and march against him. So we receive this peace by the blood of Jesus which was shed on the cross to atone for our sins. So we receive this peace with God. And when we have this peace 
in our hearts. Now we are expected to spread that peace of God to others. So in application, Christians, let's unite with each other and proclaim God's gospel of peace to the world. Are your feet fitted with the readiness to take back territory from Satan and win people for Christ? Don't be slowed by those who say you shouldn't call people of other cultures and other countries to Christ. Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Don't be held back by those who say all religions are equally helpful and who say you should leave everyone to their own religion and not try to lead them to faith in Jesus. Jesus does not say every religion works equally well. Jesus says in John chapter 14 verse 6, no one comes to the Father except through me. So why let people get held up in religions knowing very well that they will die and go to hell? Because the only way to heaven is through Christ Jesus. Because sin cannot be gotten rid of by religion. And remember, we are sinners not because we sin. We are sinners because we are descendants of Adam who sinned. And therefore, we died spiritually to God. Our spirits can only become alive again to God by believing and receiving Jesus as the Lord of our life and personal Savior. The Word of God tells us in John, in John chapter 1 verse 12, that to those who believed him, to those who received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So it is only Jesus who makes our spirits that are dead to God to become alive again to God. And it's only Jesus who is the only way to God. Any other way is a falsehood from the devil so that people may die and go to hell without salvation. For salvation is found not in religion, not in the keeping of the law of Moses. Salvation is only found in Christ Jesus and Christ alone. Religion doesn't give peace with God. Only Jesus does. Religion doesn't give lasting inner peace. Only Jesus does. Religion doesn't have the power to defeat Satan. Only Jesus does. Religion does not give eternal life. Only Jesus does. Religion doesn't have the power to bring world peace. Only Jesus does. World peace will occur only after Satan has been defeated. His, his lies have been debunked. And Jesus comes again to bring the whole world under his reign of peace. True peace comes only through the gospel of peace. Believe that gospel and then go on the march to spread it everywhere. Jesus is on a mission and he calls you to join in his mission. The Bible says he himself, that is the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 to verse 17. The Bible says he himself is our peace. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. To all whose feet are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, the Bible promises in Romans chapter 16 verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 16. So that is the footwear that you are required to put on. That footwear entails peace with God. So you've got to believe and receive Jesus first as the Lord of your life and personal Savior for you to be at peace with God. It also entails now inner peace. That peace of God has come into you by faith in Christ Jesus. So you have the inner peace. And it also entails spreading that peace to others so that they may also enter that peace treaty that God has entered by shedding the blood of his son Lord Jesus on the cross to atone for our sins. 
so that we be reconciled back to him. So when we spread this message of the gospel, we'll bring other people to faith in Christ Jesus, and they will share in that peace with God. And with them having that inner peace from God, they will be able also to join us in spreading this inner peace, this peace with God to others. And that is how this, the gospel is spread out. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 that he shall build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Building the church is not physical stone structures. It is advancing the kingdom of God to the hearts of people. And Jesus is doing that with the redeemed, those he has already redeemed. Those who have already received the peace of God by faith in him are the ones he has commissioned to take that gospel of peace to other people who have not heard it so that also they may hear the truth, so that this truth of the gospel may set them free, free from Satan and free from sin. And as we have come to the end of today's message, as we shall give you, if you are there and you have never given your life to Christ, you have never experienced this peace with God. This is your moment. You can never have peace. You can never draw peace from anything that is in this world. You can only draw peace from God. And this peace is in Christ Jesus. You can only receive it by faith in Christ Jesus. And when now you have it, you have now that peace to share with others, to witness for Christ so that they may also receive the peace that you have, also, you have also received, peace with God. So therefore, this is your moment to receive Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior, so that we be reconciled back to God, so that when you die, your spirit will go to heaven and not to hell. For the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, that there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And apparently the blood of sinners, the blood of people, the blood of the sinner cannot pay for his sins. Neither could the blood of animals pay for the sins of people. It would only cover their sins in the Old Testament. But now Jesus has come and the word of God tells us in John chapter 1 verse 29 that behold he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He will take away your sins when you believe and receive him as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. So that when you die, you will wake up to be ushered into heaven. The word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that it is given for one to die once, after that, judgment. If you die having not believed and received Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior, you will die with your sins on you, and you will only wake up for judgment. And your judgment is already as good has concluded if you die having not believed and received Jesus as the Lord of your life and Savior. Satan is judged already. Sin is judged already. But human beings are not judged because they have the opportunity to receive this message of peace with God. They have the opportunity to believe and receive Jesus. But after one has died, then they have wasted that opportunity. They will only wake up now for judgment. So if you die having not believed and received Jesus, you have already judged yourself. Not worth of entering heaven, but worthy of spending your eternity in hell with the devil, in the hellfire. So therefore, my brothers and sisters who are listening to me, and you have never given your life to Christ, you've been held up in some form of religion, Know this, that salvation is only found in Christ Jesus. The word of God tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 12, that this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and that life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So that is what it is. And this is your moment. To receive this eternal life. So I'll make this prayer. And then you repeat after me. And you'll be born again. You mean it in your heart. God is not so much interested with the words. 
as he is with the condition of your heart. As he is with the attitude of your heart when you make this prayer. So therefore, mean it in your heart as you make this prayer. And you will be born again to God. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner. And you died for me on the cross. This day, I open the door of my heart. I welcome you to come in, forgive my sins, and be the Lord of my life and personal Savior. And write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. If you have made that prayer, you are now a born again Christian. Now you need to look for a Bible believing church because you need to grow with other believers in Christ. And you also need to invest in a Bible because the word of God is the food for the spirit. The word of God will help you grow spiritually. So you need to be reading the word of God every day and to be applying the word of God in every area of your life. And where do you begin in the Bible? You begin from the Gospel of John. Why the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John reveals to you who Christ is. And as you continue reading the Gospel of John, you read it chapter by chapter. Don't read your Bible randomly. Read your Bible systematically. So let the Gospel of John be your beginning point in reading the Bible. And as you come to the end of the Gospel of John, the next book is the book of Acts. The book of Acts will show you how believers in Christ were baptized by the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, so that you may desire also to be baptized in the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. You'll only need to pray and ask Jesus to baptize you with the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will do that. You'll be empowered because he has promised in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, that we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon us. And we shall be witnesses to him in our Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. So Jesus will baptize you with his Holy Spirit power. And you will be able to live victorious Christian life. You will be able to do the things that you will see believers in Christ doing in the book of Acts. Laying hands on the sick, and the sick receive their healing binding and casting out demons as you advance the message of the gospel to others so that others also may enter this peace treaty that God has made by shedding the blood of Jesus on the cross so that they may also have peace with God, may have peace in their heart and may spread out peace to others so that they may have their feet shod with the gospel of peace. That is peace with God, peace in our heart, and speed and peace spread out to others. Now, as we have come to the end of today's message, may the Lord bless you until we meet again. Amen.